Book Eight, Chapter Nine of Ben Hur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Ben Hur: A Tale of the Christ, by Lew Wallace, Book Eight, Chapter Nine. Next morning, about the second hour, two men rode full speed to the doors of Ben Hur's tents, and dismounting, asked to see him. He was not yet risen, but gave directions for their admission. "'Peace to you, brethren,' he said, for they were of his Galileans, and trusted officers. "'Will you be seated?' "'Nay,' the senior replied, bluntly. "'To sit and be at ease is to let the Nazarene die. Rise, son of Judah, and go with us. The judgment has been given. The tree of the cross is already at Golgotha.' Ben-Hur stared at them. The cross, was all he could for the moment say. They took him last night and tried him, the man continued. At dawn they led him before Pilate. Twice the Roman denied his guilt. Twice he refused to give him over. At last he washed his hands and said, Be it upon you, then. And they answered. Who answered? They, the priests and people, his blood be upon us and our children. Holy Father Abraham, cried Ben-Hur, a Roman kinder to an Israelite than his own kin. And if, ah, if he should indeed be the Son of God, what shall ever wash his blood from their children? It must not be. Tis time to fight. His face brightened with resolution, and he clapped his hands. The horses, and quickly— he said to the Arab who answered the signal, and bid Amro send me fresh garments, and bring my sword. It is time to die for Israel, my friends. Tarry without till I come. He ate a crust, drank a cup of wine, and was soon upon the road. Whither would you go first? asked the Galilean. To collect the legions. Alas! the man replied, throwing up his hands. Why, alas! "'Master,' the man spoke with shame, "'Master, I and my friend here are all that are faithful. The rest do follow the priests.' "'Seeking what?' And Ben-Hur drew rein. "'To kill him?' "'Not the Nazarene.' "'You have said it.' Ben-Hur looked slowly from one man to the other. He was hearing again the question of the night before— the cup my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? In the ear of the Nazarene he was putting his own question. If I bring thee rescue, wilt thou accept it? He was saying to himself, This death may not be averted. The man has been travelling towards it with full knowledge from the day he began his mission. It is imposed by a will higher than his. Whose but the Lord's? If he is consenting— if he goes to it voluntarily, what shall another do? Nor less did Ben-Hur see the failure of the scheme he had built upon the fidelity of the Galileans. Their desertion, in fact, left nothing more of it. But how singular it should happen that morning of all others! A dread seized him. It was possible his scheming and labour and expenditure of treasure might have been but blasphemous contention with God. When he picked up the reins and said, "'Let us go, brethren,' all before him was uncertainty, the faculty of resolving quickly, without which one cannot be a hero in the midst of stirring scenes, was numb within him. "'Let us go, brethren, let us go to Golgotha.' They passed through excited crowds of people going south, like themselves. All the country north of the city seemed aroused and in motion." Hearing that the procession with the condemned might be met with somewhere near the great white towers left by Herod, the three friends rode thither, passing round southeast of Acre. In the valley below the pool of Hezekiah, passageway against the multitude became impossible, and they were compelled to dismount and take shelter behind the corner of a house and wait. The waiting was as if they were on a river bank watching a flood go by, for such the people seemed. There are certain chapters in the first book of this story, 
which were written to give the reader an idea of the composition of the Jewish nationality as it was in the time of Christ. They were also written in anticipation of this hour and scene, so that he who has read them with attention can now see all Ben-Hur saw of the going to the crucifixion, a rare and wonderful sight. Half an hour, an hour, the flood surged by Ben-Hur and his companions, with an arm's reach, incessant, undiminished. At the end of that time he could have said, I have seen all the castes of Jerusalem, all the sects of Judea, all the tribes of Israel, and all the nationalities of earth represented by them. The Libyan Jew went by, and the Jew of Egypt, and the Jew from the Rhine. In short, Jews from all east countries and all west countries, and all islands within commercial connection. They went by on foot, on horseback, on camels, in litters and chariots, and with an infinite variety of costumes, yet with the same marvellous similitude of features which to-day particularizes the children of Israel, tried as they have been by climates and modes of life. They went by speaking all known tongues, for by that means only were they distinguishable group from group. They went by in haste, eager, anxious, crowding, all to behold one poor Nazarene die, a felon between felons. These were the many, but they were not all. Born along with the stream were thousands not Jews, thousands hating and despising them, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Syrians, Africans, Egyptians, Easterns, so that, studying the mass, it seemed the whole world was to be represented, and in that sense present at the crucifixion. The going was singularly quiet. A hoof-stroke upon a rock, the glide and rattle of revolving wheels, voices in conversation, and now and then a calling voice, were all the sounds heard above the rustle of the mighty movement. Yet there was, upon every countenance, the look with which men make haste to see some dreadful sight, some sudden wreck, or ruin, or calamity of war. And by such signs Ben Hur judged that these were the strangers in the city come up to the Passover, who had had no part in the trial of the Nazarene, and might be his friends. At length, from the direction of the great towers, Ben Hur heard, at first faint in the distance, a shouting of many men. Hark! They are coming now, said one of his friends. The people in the street halted to hear, but as the cry rang on over their heads, they looked at each other and in shuddering silence moved along. The shouting drew nearer each moment, and the air was already full of it and trembling, when Ben-Hur saw the servants of Simonides coming with their master in his chair, and Esther walking by his side, a covered litter was next behind them. "'Peace to you, O Simonides, and to you, Esther,' said Ben-Hur, meeting them. "'If you are for Golgotha, stay until the procession passes. I will then go with you. There is room to turn in by the house here.' The merchant's large head rested heavily upon his breast. Rousing himself, he answered, "'Speak to Balthazar. His pleasure will be mine.' He is in the litter. Ben-Hur hastened to draw aside the curtain. The Egyptian was lying within, his wan face so pinched as to appear like a dead man's. The proposal was submitted to him. "'Can we see him?' he inquired faintly. "'The Nazarene? Yes. He must pass within a few feet of us.' "'Dear Lord!' the old man cried fervently. "'Once more!' Once more. Oh, it is a dreadful day for the world. Shortly the whole party were in waiting under shelter of the house. They said but little, afraid, probably, to trust their thoughts to each other. Everything was uncertain, and nothing so much so as opinions. Balthazar drew himself feebly from the litter, and stood supported by a servant. Esther and Ben-Hur kept Simonides' company. Meantime the flood poured along, if anything, more densely than before, and the shouting came nearer, shrill up in the air, hoarse along the earth, 
and cruel. At last the procession was up. See, said Ben Hur bitterly, that which cometh now is Jerusalem. The advance was in possession of an army of boys, hooting and screaming, The King of the Jews! Room, room for the King of the Jews! Simonides watched them as they whirled and danced along, like a cloud of summer insects, and said gravely, When these come to their inheritance, son of her, alas for the city of Solomon! A band of legionaries fully armed followed next, marching in sturdy indifference, the glory of burnished brass about them the while. Then came the Nazarene. He was nearly dead. Every few steps he staggered as if he would fall. A stained gown, badly torn, hung from his shoulders over a seamless undertunic. His bare feet left red splotches upon the stones. An inscription on a board was tied to his neck. A crown of thorns had been crushed hard down upon his head, making cruel wounds from which streams of blood, now dry and blackened, had run over his face and neck. The long hair, tangled in the thorns, was clotted thick. The skin, where it could be seen, was ghastly white. His hands were tied before him. Back somewhere in the city he had fallen exhausted under the transverse beam of his cross, which, as a condemned person, custom required him to bear to the place of execution. Now a countryman carried the burden in his stead. Four soldiers went with him as a guard against the mob, who sometimes nevertheless broke through and struck him with sticks, and spit upon him. Yet no sound escaped him, neither remonstrance nor groan, nor did he look up until he was nearly in front of the house sheltering Ben-Hur and his friends, all of whom were moved with quick compassion. Esther clung to her father, and he, strong of will as he was, trembled. Balthasar fell down speechless. Even Ben-Hur cried out, "'Oh, my God! My God!' Then, as if he divined their feelings or heard the exclamation, the Nazarene turned his wan face towards the party, and looked at them each one, so they carried the look in memory through life. They could see he was thinking of them, not himself, and the dying eyes gave them the blessing he was not permitted to speak. "'Where are thy legions, son of her?' asked Simonides, aroused. "'Hannes can tell thee better than I.' "'What? Faithless?' all but these two. Then all is lost, and this good man must die. The face of the merchant knit convulsively as he spoke, and his head sank upon his breast. He had borne his part in Ben-Hur's labours well, and he had been inspired by the same hopes, now blown out, never to be rekindled. Two other men succeeded the Nazarene bearing crossbeams. "'Who are these?' Ben-Hur asked of the Galileans. "'Thieves appointed to die with the Nazarene,' they replied. Next in the procession stalked a mitred figure clad all in the golden vestments of the high priest. Policemen from the temple curtained him round about, and after him, in order, strode the Sanhedrin, and a long array of priests, the latter in their plain white garments, overwrapped by abnets of many folds and gorgeous colours. "'The son-in-law of Hannes,' said Ben-Hur, in a low voice. "'Caiaphas! I have seen him,' Simonides replied, adding, after a pause during which he thoughtfully watched the haughty pontiff, "'And now am I convinced, with such assurance as proceeds from clear enlightenment of the spirit, with absolute assurance, now know I that he who first goes yonder with the inscription about his neck is what the inscription proclaims him, King of the Jews. A common man, an impostor, a felon, was never thus waited upon. For look, here are the nations, Jerusalem, Israel. Here is the ephod, here the blue robe with its fringe, and purple pomegranates and golden bells, not seen in the street since the day Jadua went out to meet the Macedonian. 
proves all that this Nazarene is king. Would I could rise and go after him. Ben-Hur listened, surprised, and directly, as if himself awakening to his unusual display of feeling, Simonides said impatiently, "'Speak to Balthazar, I pray you, and let us be gone. The vomit of Jerusalem is coming.' Then Esther spoke. "'I see some women there, and they are weeping. Who are they?' Following the pointing of her hand, the party beheld four women in tears. One of them leaned upon the arm of a man of aspect not unlike the Nazarene's. Presently Ben-Hur answered, "'The man is the disciple whom the Nazarene loves the best of all. She who leans upon his arm is Mary, the master's mother. The others are friendly women of Galilee.' Esther pursued the mourners with glistening eyes, until the multitude received them out of sight. It may be the reader will fancy the foregoing snatches of conversation were had in quiet, but it was not so. The talking was, for the most part, like that indulged by people at the seaside under the sound of the surf, for to nothing else can the clamour of this division of the mob be so well likened. The demonstration was the forerunner of those in which, scarce thirty years later, under the rule of the factions, the holy city was torn to pieces. It was quite as great in numbers, as fanatical and bloodthirsty, boiled and raved, and had in it exactly the same elements. Servants, camel-drivers, market-men, gatekeepers, gardeners, dealers in fruits and wines, proselytes and foreigners not proselytes, watchmen and menials from the temple, thieves, robbers, and the myriads not assignable to any class, but who, on such occasions as this, appeared no one could say whence, hungry and smelling of caves and old tombs, bareheaded wretches with naked arms and legs, hair and beard and uncombed mats, and each with one garment the colour of clay, beasts with abysmal mouths, in outcry effective as lions calling each other across desert spaces. Some of them had swords, a greater number flourished spears and javelins, though the weapons of the many were staves and knotted clubs, and slings for which latter selected stones were stored in scripts, and sometimes in sacks improvised from the foreskirts of their dirty tunics. Among the mass here and there appeared persons of high degree, scribes, elders, rabbis, Pharisees with broad fringing, Sadducees in fine cloaks, serving for the time as prompters and directors. If a throat tired of one cry, they invented another for it. If brassy lungs showed signs of collapse, they set them going again. And yet the clamour, loud and continuous as it was, could have been reduced to a few syllables. King of the Jews! Room for the King of the Jews! Defiler of the Temple! Blasphemer of God! Crucify him! crucify him! And of these cries the last one seemed in greatest favour, because, doubtless, it was more directly expressive of the wish of the mob, and helped to better articulate its hatred of the Nazarene. Come, said Simonides, when Balthazar was ready to proceed, come, let us forward. Ben-Hur did not hear the call. The appearance of the part of the procession then passing, its brutality and hunger for life, were reminding him of the Nazarene, his gentleness, and the many charities he had seen him do for suffering men. Suggestions beget suggestions, so he remembered suddenly his own great indebtedness to the man, the time he himself was in the hands of a Roman guard going, as was supposed, to a death as certain and almost as terrible as this one of the cross the cooling drink he had at the well by Nazareth, and the divine expression of the face of him who gave it, the later goodness, the miracle of Palm Sunday, and with these recollections, the thought of his present powerlessness to give back help for help, or make returning kind, stung him keenly, and he accused himself. He had not done all he might. He could have watched with the Galileans, and kept them true and ready. And this— Ah! this was the moment to strike. 
a blow well given now would not merely disperse the mob and set the Nazarene free. It would be a trumpet call to Israel, and precipitate the long-dreamt-of war for freedom. The opportunity was going. The minutes were bearing it away. And if lost, God of Abraham, was there nothing to be done, nothing? That instant a party of Galileans caught his eye. He rushed through the press and overtook them. "'Follow me,' he said. "'I would have speech with you.' The men obeyed him, and when they were under shelter of the house, he spoke again. "'You are of those who took my swords, and agreed with me to strike for freedom and the king who was coming. You have the swords now, and now is the time to strike with them. Go, look everywhere, and find our brethren, and tell them to meet me at the tree of the cross making ready for the Nazarene.' Haste all of you. Nay, stand not so. The Nazarene is the king, and freedom dies with him. They looked at him respectfully, but did not move. Hear you? he asked. Then one of them replied, Son of Judah. By that name they knew him. Son of Judah, it is you who are deceived, not we or our brethren who have your swords. The Nazarene is not the king, neither has he the spirit of a king. We were with him when he came into Jerusalem. We saw him in the temple. He failed himself, and us, and Israel. At the gate beautiful he turned his back upon God and refused the throne of David. He is not king, and Galilee is not with him. He shall die the death. But hear you, son of Judah, we have your swords, and we are ready now to draw them and strike for freedom, and so is Galilee. Be it for freedom, O son of Judah, for freedom, and we will meet you at the tree of the cross. The sovereign moment of his life was upon Ben-Hur. Could he have taken the offer and said the word, history might have been other than it is. But then it would have been history ordered by men, not God, something that never was and never will be. A confusion fell upon him. He knew not how, though afterwards he attributed it to the Nazarene, for when the Nazarene was risen he understood the death was necessary to faith in the resurrection, without which Christianity would be an empty husk. The confusion, as has been said, left him without the faculty of decision. He stood helpless, wordless even, Covering his face with his hand, he shook with the conflict between his wish, which was what he would have ordered, and the power that was upon him. "'Come, we are waiting for you,' said Simonides, the fourth time. Thereupon he walked mechanically after the chair and the litter. Esther walked with him. Like Balthazar and his friends, the wise men, the day they went to the meeting in the desert, he was being led along the way. End of chapter.